Having dealt with the red blood cells, we are now going to move on to the next element in the hematopoietic series and that is the WBCs or the white blood cells. What you already know from the previous discussion is that what was the common precursor cell from which everything in the bone marrow is arising? Correct, it is a hematopoietic stem cell. I want you to recall a hematopoietic stem cell was giving rise to a common myeloid precursor and a common lymphoid precursor. So from the myeloid precursor, the myeloid, erythroid, megakaryocytic series was coming and from the common lymphoid precursor, all the lymphoid lineage was coming. Let's first deal with that myeloid lineage. So what is the first cell in this myeloid lineage that would form? We are going to now deal with myelopoiesis. So first you must know the normal. After that we'll see at what step where all defect can occur. So the first cell obviously in a myeloid series will be a myeloblast. Following the myeloblast, so wherever the word or the term blast comes, you consider it to be primitive. So myeloblast is the first cell. After the myeloblast, the next cell that comes is a promyelocyte. And do you see that I've made this promyelocyte bigger than the myeloblast? This promyelocyte is actually the biggest cell in this entire series that we will deal with. So the first cell is the myeloblast, then it forms a promyelocyte. Next, as soon as you see a cell which is having this D-shaped nucleus, it is a myelocyte. After this, the next cell that comes is a metamyelocyte, where you see that the nucleus is now showing some indentation. When that indentation increases further, what we get is a band cell. Remember, a band cell is also known as a stab cell. And finally, after the band or the stab cell, we have a mature neutrophil, which is going to have these segmented nuclear lobes. So the summary over here that I want you to derive, the primitive cell would be the myeloblast. The largest cell that we would have would be the promyelocyte. Then remove the pro, what are you left with? Myelocyte. Add something onto it. So now you have metamyelocyte where the nucleus starts showing this indentation. When the indentation increases further, what we have is a band cell and that is also known as a stab cell. And finally, in the end, we have reached a mature cell. Now, this mature cell can be a neutrophil, it can be an eosinophil and it can be a basophil, any of the granular series. So, eosinophils have granules, basophils have granules, neutrophils have granules, all of them will come from this particular series. So, where in this series is it decided that, okay, this series is going towards a neutrophil, eosinophil or basophil? So, at what point is it decided? Remember, at the stage of a myelocyte, that is where the specific granules will appear. The specific granules will appear. So, if this series has to end as an eosinophil, at the stage of the myelocyte, those orange-pink granules will start coming. If this series has to end in a basophil, then at the stage of a myelocyte, those blackish granules will start appearing. So, those specific granules will start coming, myelocyte and onwards. Now, having dealt the main myelopoiesis, let's go back and revise something that we did right in the beginning in probably the initial chapters, how to identify these various WBCs. So, the next thing that you need to know is this image. Now this is very important and this is why is it more important is because all five WBCs you're seeing in one image and now you should be able to label them properly. So the first one that you see over here, the first one, I told you that any cell which has these multiple nuclear lobes is going to be a neutrophil. So multiple nuclear lobes, neutrophil. Okay, the next one, the simple looking cell with a central round simple nucleus, no special change in the shape or the size, this then becomes a lymphocyte. Okay, the next one. Over here you see there is this one cell which has an altogether different color. It is showing those orange-pink granules. 
So this becomes an eosinophil. Next you have this cell where you can see that the nucleus is going to be kidney shaped. I hope you can recall kidney shaped or reniform nucleus was a monocyte. And lastly the cell where you cannot appreciate the nucleus because it is covered entirely by these coarse blue-black granules. That particular cell becomes a basophil. So these are the five cells around which this entire chapter is going to revolve. If you have nuclear lobes, consider a neutrophil. If you have a simple looking cell, lymphocyte. If you have a special color, orange-pink, eosinophil. If you have a kidney-shaped nucleus, monocyte. And when you can't appreciate practically anything and the entire cell is covered by this bad looking granules, so it becomes a basophil. So this is the summary that you need to know when it comes to the image identification. Moving ahead, this is what we've spoken about the end, right? That is in the end, these are the five types of cells that can form. But what was the first cell right in the beginning of the series? The blast. So I told you that the myeloid series will come from the myeloblast. The lymphoid series will come from a lymphoblast. So when it comes to image-based questions, you need to differentiate between a myeloblast and a lymphoblast. So let's see each one of these. The image that you see here is a myeloblast and the next one are cluster of lymphoblasts. Why am I calling them? Let's take each cell individually. First, let's consider the size. Very obvious, the myeloblast is going to have a bigger size than a lymphoblast. Now, the trick of remembering this table is, everything will be more in a myeloblast. So, M for myeloblast, M for more. Whatever features I will tell, the more of it will be in the myeloblast. So, which cell has a greater size, a more greater size? A myeloblast. From the cell size, now let's go to the interior. Which cell is showing granules? Remember, everything is going to go in favor of a myeloblast. So, the granules will be seen in the myeloblast. They will not be seen in a lymphoblast. Now, when many of these granules combine, it results in the formation of something known as an ore rod. Which blast is going to show an ore rod? everything in favor of myeloblast. So, myeloblast will show or rods, lymphoblast will not show or rods. Let's see more examples of or rods. So, if you see these two images, they are full of or rods. Easily you can appreciate over here, this cell over here, this entire area, these cells, all of these cells are studded with or rods. They are nothing but the granules they have fused and they've taken the shape of a rod. All the granules combined, they formed a rod. Remember, what is extremely important for you to know over here is that all rods are the most characteristic finding that you have. If you have to consider that one thing that will help you differentiate between a myeloblast and a lymphoblast, that one answer, it has to be an all rod. If an all rod is present, there is no way that that cell can be a lymphoblast. It has to be a myeloblast. And lastly, considering the nucleolus, which cell will have or which nucleus will have a nucleolus? Everything has to be more in a myeloblast. So if you focus on the nucleus, over here you see this round area inside the nucleus. This is a nucleolus. Do you see that area in a lymphoblast? No. So everything more, size more in myeloblast, granules in myeloblast, or rods in myeloblast, nucleolus in myeloblast. So that is the trick that you need to remember and these two images will actually form a basis of a lot of disorders that we will do here onwards. Other changes that you need to know between the two. Now if someone asks you between a lymphoblast and a myeloblast is there any special stain that you can do? So yes, for a myeloblast we have two very important stains MPO that is myeloperoxidase and SBB that is Sudan Black B, myeloperoxidase and Sudan Black B. Whereas for the lymphoblast, we have two important stains. One is the PAS stain or the per iodic acid shift stain. 
this is a stain that we've done earlier also and I want you to recall that a past stain of a lymphoblast is going to characteristically show you these blocks. So this is the block positivity that is seen. So past stain block positivity is one of those favorite questions not only in your entrance exams but also for all those second year MBBS students in your practical exam that one pass and fail question that you have in hematology block positivity pass stain for a lymphoblast. The other stain that we have over here is acid phosphatase and the property over here you know that lymphoid series is B cell and T cell. So for the time being, remember, a lymphoblast can also be B cell and T cell. Acid phosphatase is that particular type of stain which will particularly stain the T lymphoblast. It will particularly stain the T lymphoblast. That is again another question that is asked in the exam. So pass will give a block positivity. That is question number one. Acid phosphatase will also stain the lymphoblast. But which type of lymphoblast? Particularly the T lymphoblast. So this is very important information that you need to know for the exam. Now moving ahead, let's consider certain disorders. Disorders can be very simple. So this is not something that you will be asked in the exam, but this is for your understanding. Disorders mean in the WBC, you also call them leukocytes. So in the WBCs, if the count goes down, you will call it leukopenia. And in the WBCs, if the count goes high, you will call it leukocytosis. What is the normal WBC count? The normal WBC count is 4000 to 11000 per cubic mm. So anything less than 4000 or 4k would be a leukopenic condition. Anything more than 11k, you would call it leukocytosis. So just remember 4 to 11 is the range for you. Now, when there is an increase, when the WBC count increases, either it can be because of some benign or non-tumorous conditions, like if someone is suffering from an infection, viral infection, bacterial infection, or it can be because of certain cancerous conditions, what you obviously know as leukemias and lymphomas. We will come to leukemias and lymphomas in a while, but first let's do what we encounter daily in day-to-day -day life. What we encounter, you would encounter in the outpatient department during your ward postings. You might not deal on a regular basis with patients of cancers and leukemias, but you will deal with patients of suffering from fever, cough, viral infection, bacterial infection. So you should know how to read a report and how to derive from the report what type of an infection the patient is suffering from. So let's consider those first. If these are the five main ones that you need to know. First of all, I told you that the normal WBC count is going to be 4000 to 11000 per cubic mm. Remember, of these, neutrophils are 40 to 70 percent. What are the conditions in which the neutrophil will increase? I hope you remember neutrophils are cells of acute inflammation. These will increase in certain bacterial infections. They will increase in the bacterial infections. Also neutrophils can increase in response to certain drugs like steroids tend to increase the neutrophil count. So when you have an increase in neutrophil in a patient, you need not necessarily straight away jump to the conclusion that the patient has a bacterial infection. Also consider taking some history. Has the patient consumed any drug? Has the patient been on a recent steroid course? Also a drug that is used in the treatment of mania, that is lithium, that can also cause an increase in neutrophil. So that is a pharmacology link that you need to know over here. Next one we have with a lymphocyte. So a lymphocyte has a normal proportion of 20 to 40 percent. And I hope you can recall lymphocyte was a cell of chronic inflammation. Lymphocyte levels will be increased in viral infections. Also, is there any particular infection, particularly in India, in our setting, which tends to have an increase in lymphocytes? Yes, it is tuberculosis. So remember this key point, viral infections and TB. 
In TB, when you see the blood report of a patient, there will be an increase in the lymphocyte count. Next, we have monocytes. The normal monocyte count is or the percentage is 2 to 10 percent. I again hope you can recall monocytes were cells of chronic inflammation. And one condition which you need to know, M for monocyte and M for malaria. So monocyte count will be increased when a patient is suffering from malaria. So if the clinician sends you a sample where the clinician is clinically suspecting that the patient has malaria, the first thing as soon as you run the sample on the counter and you see that okay the monocyte count is elevated, automatically it should come to your mind that in the peripheral smear I should look for a malaria parasite. So M for monocyte, M for malaria. Next comes eosinophil. The normal eosinophil range is 1 to 5 percent and eosinophils are increased in parasitic infections. Very important, parasitic infections. It is increased in allergies. So I hope you can recall type 1 hypersensitivity. The hypersensitivity which was to do with allergies was showing an increase in eosinophils and also certain lymphomas which we will discuss shortly in the upcoming section. Hodgkin's lymphoma has a background showing eosinophils. So if someone asks you, can eosinophil increase also be seen in a tumor? Yes, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, there is an increase in eosinophils. Lastly, we have basophils. Now this is only 0 to 1%. Very rarely do you actually see a basophil in a peripheral smear because it is usually not there, 0 to 1%. And basophil will be increased in case of it will be increased in case of allergy and a very important, again, tumorous condition, CML. That one thing, as soon as you listen about basophil, that first keyword that should come to your mind in the exam is CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. So again, this is a key point and we would repeat this when we go to CML, a very important criteria that CML shows an increase in the basophils. So this is what is going to help you in your day-to-day -day life. So before you jump on to all the complicated things, you should always make your basics clear which will help you in everyday practice. Now having discussed this outline, the next thing that you need to know is what are the WBC abnormalities. Please remember, I am still not jumping to the leukemias and the lymphomas. I am still dealing with the non-neoplastic, non-tumorous conditions. And there are a set of four to five conditions that you need to know over here, which I've summarized and with the help of mnemonics, we'll remember. One or two probably we've already done in general pathology, so that would act as a revision process for us. Let's take the first one. What do you appreciate over here? I hope you know and you can recall now that this is a cell having multiple nuclear lobes, so this is a hypersegmented neutrophil. Now, neutrophil you can understand, but you would ask me why am I calling it hypersegmented? I told you when we discussed a neutrophil that neutrophil has three to five lobes. But if you see over here, there are approximately six to seven lobes that you can see in this neutrophil. So obviously, if it is not having three to five lobes, if it has more than that, we would now call this a hypersegmented neutrophil. And I hope you can recall which anemia was showing this hypersegmented neutrophil. It was megaloblastic anemia, the anemia in which it, there was B12 and folic acid deficiency. But is there any other condition where you can get this? Definitely. You can also see this in alcoholism. You can also see this in liver diseases. But for the exam, what is important for you is when you read this, the first anemia that you should think of will always be megaloblastic, keyword in the question. Now, this is when the number of lobes are more. Now, what if the number of lobes are less, like in this image? In this image, you see that there are neutrophils showing only two lobes each. So, now you would call this a hyposegmented neutrophil. More lobes, hypersegmented, less lobes, hyposegmented, but they've not kept it that simple. Hyposegmented neutrophils have been given the name of an anomaly called Pelger Hewitt anomaly. Now, students, there are two terms. There is something known as a Pelger Hewitt anomaly and there is something known as a pseudo Pelger Hewitt anomaly. What I want you to understand is 
if there is some genetic disorder in the patient, if this neutrophil hypolobation or hyposegmentation is because it is inherited in the family, it is genetic, you would call it pelger Hewitt. But if it is not running in the family, it is not inherited, it is not genetic, you will call it pseudo pelger Hewitt anomaly. So just on the basis of whether a genetic element is involved or not, the word pseudo will be added. Now, in pseudo pelger Hewitt anomaly, there is no genetic element, means it is not running in the family. There is this one person who has these neutrophils showing only two, two lobes. Rest, no one in his family has this problem. Then why is this person having this problem? Now, remember, pseudo pelger Hewitt anomaly is seen in two very important conditions. It is seen in MDS, that is myelodysplastic syndrome. And it is seen in CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, right? So MDS and CML will show this pseudo pelger Hewitt anomaly. If the question says only pelger Hewitt, means it is some genetic disorder. But what the main point is, as soon as you read pelger, it means hyposegmented neutrophil. Okay, moving ahead. Over here, this is a very important image over here because this is a very important anomaly. The name of the anomaly is the May-Heglin anomaly. What I want you to do is focus on the term Heglin and from these alphabets we'll derive what all can we see. So one G over here stands for giant platelets. So the platelets are going to be large in size. The next alphabet is L that stands for low platelet count. That is what you commonly call, call as thrombocytopenia low platelet count. So, two disorders of platelets. One, the platelet count is low. Second, the platelet size is large. And lastly, we have IN. And IN stands for these inclusions. So, the neutrophils or all the granulocytes are going to show inclusions. Now, let's see in this image itself. So, over here you see this is a neutrophil. And inside the neutrophil, there is this large inclusion. So, inclusions in the granulocytes. What you see over here, this is a platelet. If you can see, the platelet has almost become equal to the size of an RBC. Platelet is supposed to be 3 microns or so, RBC is 7 to 8 microns. Platelet is taking the size of an RBC, so the platelet is becoming giant. So now you know May-Heglin anomaly, giant platelets, low platelet count and inclusions in the granulocytes. With this mnemonic that I've made for you from the word itself, I hope you won't forget the various features. The next one. Over here you see the first image. There are these large cytoplasmic granules and I hope you can recall this was seen in shediac higashi syndrome. Remember that condition in phagocytosis where there was a defective phagolysosome formation? Over there, these large cytoplasmic granules are seen. Next, the last one that we have, again, in this also, you can appreciate that there are large cytoplasmic granules. They have covered the entire neutrophil. This is seen in alder Rayleigh anomaly. So, if you see few of these granules, think of shediac higashi. If you see many of these granules covering the entire neutrophil, think of alder Rayleigh anomaly. So these five anomalies are important and unfortunately many students tend to ignore these. So let's quickly recall them. The first one that we had more of segments, hypersegmented neutrophil. Second one, less of segments, hyposegmented neutrophil or pelger Hewitt anomaly. Cytoplasmic granules, large, prominent, shediac higashi. Granules which are large covering the entire cell alder Rayleigh really anomaly and an anomaly where you see inclusions, where you see giant platelets, where you see low platelet count from the name itself, may Heglin anomaly. So these are all the non-tumorous or the non-neoplastic WBC abnormalities that you need to know of.